Good afternoon and welcome to the show. I'm your guest host, Brittany Hobson, filling in for Melissa Ridgen, who is busy with producer duties. So happy to fill in today as we put some incredible chefs in focus. You know, if, even if you're like me and not a big fan of cooking, I can guarantee you'll like what you see today. Plus, who doesn't like to eat, am I right? We are going to talk to two women competing on cooking shows, and we visit the kitchen of one of Winnipeg's busiest restaurants, Feast Bistro, where two cooks have created recipes especially for our In Focus audience. If you're watching this on an empty stomach, we are sorry. We're also going to share some of your culinary creations, thanks to our social media editor, Jesse Andrushko. We're going to get right into it. Joining us now, she baked her way to the top three of the Canadi Great Canadian Baking Show during the show's third season in 2019. From Okanese First Nation, now living in Regina, wife, mother, and kitchen powerhouse, Jody Robson. Jody, thank you for joining us today. I'm super excited to uh, be chatting with you. I just binged uh, the third season and uh, in two days, and it was a pleasure watching you on there and speaking to you now. So thanks for joining us. Oh, thank you for inviting me on. Um, so you've been cooking since you were little. Can you tell us about the influence your cookum had on that? Uh, well, my cookum's kitchen was the first kitchen that I've ever cooked in. Um, she let it me. She let me help her whenever she was cooking because we were always just kind of underfoot in her kitchen. So, um, pretty much, my very first experience getting to actually put something together and put it in the oven was in her kitchen. You know, many people either like to cook or like to bake. Myself, I'm more on. Uh, I like to bake, not a big cooker. And you actually like to do both. What is it about each yeah. that you love? You know, uh, well, on, honestly, I, I just love to eat, but um, I, I really enjoy just taking things. And we like to harvest our own vegetables and, and go pick our own berries and hunt. There's just something magical about taking ingredients that you've sourced and putting them together and making the house smell incredible and filling bellies and just visiting. And, and that's something we don't really get to do right now because, of course, with the way things are, but... Um, my sister does live across the street and we just trade food back and forth on our doorsteps. So that, that harvesting and picking, has that been something that uh, has been in your life since you were young? Always. Um, my cook of Beanie actually had a massive garden and she had a bunch of 4-H ribbons for it because it was incredible. It was the most amazing garden. And uh, we, we went picking every summer, and there was a lot of fishing and hunting on both sides of my, my family, my mom and my dad. Cooking at home and wanting to be on a competition like the Great Canadian Baking Show are, are quite two different things. What made you want to go on a show like that? You know, it, it was always a dream of mine to, to cook on TV. I used to watch cooking shows when we were you know, little kids growing up on the res and we only had three channels. Um, so you'd only get like one or two cooking shows if you were lucky and you dotted down the time. Um, but it was just so cool to watch somebody cook because uh, on TV and, and, and when Cookham was cooking in the kitchen, you, you sat at the kitchen table usually and you just watched and she told you what she was doing. Like she explained it as she went and I just thought that was so cool and I wanted everybody to be able to experience watching her cook because you know, it wasn't measurements or anything it was like do you just add this till it feels right and I, I loved her food and so I, I thought you know what if I can get on a cooking show or a baking show then I get to do exactly what I always wanted her to be able to do and and it was like it was just a dream and I couldn't believe it happened <laughs> Well, and you, and you talk about kind of just the measuring and, and, you know, feeling things out. And that was something that you kind of got famous for on the show. Um, you know, is that, that's, is that something that you're still doing today? It's, it's something I'll probably always do. I've never been one to follow a recipe or be precise. So, um, like, for example, the Saskatoon tart that I ended up sharing um, with APTN, we had to go back and try to track what we put in it. And I ended up having to remake the recipe because... I don't measure. <laughs> I just kind of throw things in. 
and just you know hope it works out sometimes it does sometimes it doesn't it, it it's all about the feel for me i i really think that uh the emotion you put into your food does impact the people that eat it well you mentioned the uh that tart that you made for aptn thank you for sending that vid along here we have it up now um can you talk a little bit about i guess is this a favorite recipe what uh, prompted you to make this so uh, tarts and pies are uh, a really big treat in our house. So we, I think we love pies more than we like cake, which, I mean, there's so much versatility with the pie. And um, we were, it's, it's snowy in Regina. I don't know if it is in Winnipeg, um, but it is, it, it's like winter. And in winter, what we've always done ever since I was a child is you go down to the deep freeze and you pull out bags of stuff that was frozen from the summer. And you get to kind of enjoy a little bit of a, the taste of summer, and it makes the cold months not so cold. <laughs> so we we went down to the basement, and I wanted to do a rhubarb pie, but the kids wanted to do the berry pie. So we brought up a bag of berries that we picked last summer, and we whipped up a pie. Well, a little mini tart because they're cute. They are super adorable. It looks delicious just watching it now. I'm drooling here. And I, I'm with you on that. I am much more of a pie person than I am a cake. I always say I would rather have a birthday pie than a birthday cake. Yes, same. <laughs> Um, on the show, there were some nail-biting moments. Can you tell us about kind of the, the most stressful part uh, or experience you had there? Uh, oh, there, there was quite a few. Um, I'm not used to also baking um, under a time constraint. And on the show, you know, that they, they give you a time limit. And they're like, okay, you're going to make this three-tiered cake in two hours. And I'm like, uh, at home, that would take like two days. But um, so on the show, I think the most stressful bake we had um, would have been the creme caramel. And it's only because I'm not really, I wasn't familiar with it. And it's very, very sensitive. So the time they provided us was the exact amount of time, if you knew exactly what you were doing, to make it perfectly. And I didn't have a clue. So I was just kind of like staring at everybody's station, seeing how everybody else was doing it, and everybody did it different. So um, by the time it came over, and I knew, I knew it wasn't done just when I pulled it out of the oven, and you have to chill it before you flip it out. And I knew it was going to turn into soup, so I flip it out. And it kind of looked okay at first. I'm like, okay, cool, cool. I got it. I got it. And then it just melted. And it was just a giant gelled plate of, like, curdled milk. It was so gross. That was really stressful because I had to go put that in front of the judges and be like, Here, what, here's what I've done with your recipe you've given me. I it's certainly don't envy <laughs> that. Um, the show was a little bit different. It, it seemed like there was a lot of um, love between the contestants and you know when someone went home it was very emotional. Um, I guess could you talk a little bit about maybe some of the relationships that you formed during that process? So um, the Great Canadian Baking Show is unique in the fact that it um, isn't a cutthroat competition. We're basically all there. I mean, of course, it's a competition, so we still want to win, but it's more of a learning experience. You know, you, you first off, you get to bake in the tent, and that in itself is a prize. It's There's something about just baking in that tent, that iconic tent that is, it's magic. Um, but throughout the competition, the bakers help each other. You know, we're not trying to sabotage each other. We're helping each other and you build a family it's like the bakers that i baked with in season three were a family and we still keep in touch and it's it's like a little best friend group and, and I, I love all the bakers and i mean we, we can openly tell each other we love each other because we do now it's we went through something together and it wasn't easy it was a difficult process it's a very uh, Canadian uh, way to do things, go into it lovingly with other contestants. Um, so it's been about two years uh, since uh, you partook in the show. I mean, can, what, has, uh, what has the past two years been like for you and, and where do you see your baking and cooking going? Well, um, the past two years since the show, I've definitely noticed um, an increase in expectation um, from family and friends that I normally baked for. They now have this idea that I can create 
masterpieces like I did on the show without realizing. Um, yeah, it's different when you're stressed out trying to bake as opposed to when you're at home baking. And um, I think that the uh, most incredible thing since being on the show is just having like people reach out to me on social media, like through Instagram or through Facebook, and they're like, hey, look what I made. And and prior to being on the show, I never really got that. I didn't have people showing me the cool things that they've done. And I, I just, I love that so much. Like, it's so cool to see what people, other people are capable of doing as a result of being inspired by the show. Well, um, oh, sorry, oh, sorry, that's um, about all the time that we have today. I want to thank you again, Jody, for chatting with us. It was, it's been a pleasure and I love looking at your Instagram page and checking out all your creations. Oh, thank you. Best of luck in the future. Thanks. And if you're not in the Regina area to order a tart from Jody, visit the InFocus Twitter page for Jody's Saskatoon tart recipe. We thank her so much for sharing it with us and look forward to enjoying that with some tea. Let's go to social media now with our social media editor, Jesse Andrusko, for some of our viewers' favorite treats. Thanks, Brittany. Online, we asked for everyone to share their favorite treats. We got some delicious responses. Let's take a look. First from Melody. She shared a picture of her tasty bread. She says she loves baking and that it's super rewarding. She says she doesn't eat the bread, but her family really enjoys it. Great stuff, Melody. Thomas shared this picture of a Swedish sandwich cake, which is actually based off a challenge from season two of the Great Canadian Baking Show. He said it tastes better after waiting a day once the bread soaks up all the sauces. Very interesting. I've never had a savory cake before. Kit said, in my house, Rice Krispie Squares never even make it to the pan. We, we, or I, just eat it straight out of the bowl and know it isn't pretty. I understand, Kit, I do the same thing. Gecko Spots tweeted, their custardy baked rice pudding. They say it's their favorite comfort food dessert. I've never had a rice pudding, but that looks pretty, uh, pretty good. Shauna said on Facebook, we make homemade pizza every other Friday. Pizza Fridays. Sign me up, Shauna. Missy shared a picture of herself and her daughter, Lyric, baking a layer of the vanilla cake that they made s Sunday afternoon. Lockdown fun, she says. Looks like some awesome fun. Also on Instagram, we had Maurice and Mark say they love making cinnamon rolls and gooey cinnamon buns. Thank you to everyone that shared. If you want to share your favorite treat, here's how. Join our conversation now. Like us on Facebook on our APTN News page. Follow or tweet us at APTN in Focus. And send your thoughts to infocus at aptn.ca. COVID-19 has taken its toll on businesses over the past year. Well, imagine opening a restaurant amid this pandemic. When Code Red locks down, keeps patrons out of your eatery, and you scramble to figure out how to get food into hungry bellies, then suddenly you're allowed to have people in seats, then you're not, it can be a lot for business owners. Tina House takes us to one such restaurant feeling the yo-yo effect of the pandemic. Over at Salmon and Bannock, Vancouver's only Indigenous bistro, food is being served on the small patio, which seats four people. Owner-operator Inez Cook says, these new restrictions are going to be tough on her business. We had a fairly busy weekend and we ordered like $2,000 worth of groceries to be delivered. And then all of a sudden we hear at midnight, no more dine-in. You know, it's, it's heartbreaking. Cook was a full-time flight attendant who flew internationally, but due to COVID-19, she got laid off in early March. And now this new health order is adding to her worries. She says that since the beginning of the pandemic, they have had to switch gears to cater to customers ordering on Uber Eats and refuses to let the new restrictions affect her business. So we're getting more and more creative every day and, and rolling with the punches. And, and, you know, I talked to the team and I said, I'm not going to cut any hours right now. Let's just work on new ideas. Let's get new customers and let's just get stronger. Tina House, APTN National News, Vancouver. Time for us to take a quick break, but still ahead, the youngest Top Chef Canada contestant joins us. Cowichan Tribe's own Siobhan Dekovich, stay with us.
Top Chef Canada has announced the 11 contestants who will be competing for the $100,000 prize on the upcoming ninth season of the culinary competition. Siobhan Dekovich, a Cowichan tribe member, will be among them this season. She's just 21 years old and the first Indigenous woman to keep, compete on Top Chef Canada. Here's a promo video of her. I wanted to be the teenager to go and party. I wanted to hang out with my friends, but the chefs that I grew up under were like, if you want to, like, you know, make it big, make it far, um, you got to put in the hours, put in the work. You work and it's hard. You cry every day for the most part, but you know, in the end, like something's gonna come from it. When I've done competitions, I've typically been the youngest competitor. A lot of people kind of, oh, you're young. Well, yeah. <laughs> 21-year-old can go too. <laughs> so in high school, I competed for the Skills Canada competition. I practiced once for nationals, and somehow I still managed to place bronze. Definitely opened doors for me at that point. Throughout my career, there's been times where people have doubted me, especially coming from an Aboriginal background. People will have this ideology on like the whole kind of like nation. Growing up with that, it fuels something deep in like you know deep down. It's a huge deal for someone like me to be on Top Chef Canada, not only because I'm representing a younger generation, but I'm also representing a young Indigenous nation. Thanks so much for joining us today, Siobhan, and congrats on making it into the competition. Awesome. Thank you for having me. So you started training to be a chef when you were still in high school at the age of 16. When did you know cooking would be your career? Um, honestly, I don't think it was probably until just over halfway throughout my, um, like, I guess, like, my culinary program. Um, the chef that I apprenticed under was heavily involved in competition, and I think she just, like, took me under her wing. She was super excited, like, ooh, you're a young cook. I started young. And as soon as I started getting thrown into, like, all the competitions and everything, I just kind of, like, found my niche. And once I saw the chefs kind of have their passion for food and I saw their drive, that just really drove me to kind of continue with what I was doing. And, you know, like six and a half years later, here I am still. So, <laughs> Well, quite the career in such a short time. How does your Cowichan culture influence your cooking? Um, if I'm going to be honest, I don't know too much about um, like my Cowichan kind of like heritage. Um, I didn't really grow up kind of uh, around that family or kind of with that uh, influence. Um, but what I've been very blessed with has been, uh, so I went to high school in Oliver um, here in British Columbia, a uh, very small town, but as part of like the Soyuz Indian Band Nation. And so when I was in high, um, high school and uh, culinary school, um, they were kind of like the biggest influences and kind of showed me um, and kind of like taught me some of their culture and some of their history. Um, and then so when it comes to like my cooking and stuff like that, the more I dive into my couch and um, heritage, I like to pay an homage to um, what I've learned uh, from the West Coast and bring it in with the interior. So it's like West Coast meets interior. You've got a great job as a chef at Mission Hill Winery in Kelowna. What made you want to hit pause on that to compete on Top Chef? Uh, you know what, I think like an opportunity like that, like especially with the magnitude of the competition, um, being given the opportunity, um, especially at this young of an age, it was kind of something like it, it would be crazy not to take this opportunity. Um, I think it definitely not only will open doors for my career, but it definitely has given me a huge chance just to kind of speak out not only on my story, but to kind of bring light um, and hopefully kind of like show others the beauty of like Indigenous culture. This has already been filmed. Now, we know, of course, you can't tell us the outcome, but can you share with us how high pressure this type of competition is? Oh my God, like, oh girl, let me tell you. <laughs> it's a <laughs> level of pressure. Um, it is like, I've done competition, I've done so many competitions, but like, hands down, this was the most stressful experience of my life. Like, <laughs> um, it's crazy, it's, it's, it's something that, like, you know, you, you can't prepare yourself for. Um, it's intense. <laughs> Are you able to share what the biggest challenge was? I think, like, obviously, like, when it comes to, like, the whole cooking aspect, um, the whole thing is a challenge in itself. Um, I think my biggest challenge was, like, for myself personally, was just trying not to get in my own mind and kind of, like, have that 
um, blockade of like, okay, like, you know, all these chefs that I'm competing against have like 15, 20 years of cooking experience. And I'm like, wow, that's over half my lifespan. Um, okay. <laughs> so I think it's just trying not to get too much into my own mind um, because I know definitely like that can be a huge, you know, that can like stop you. Like, like you can just kind of like not push yourself beyond what you actually are capable of doing. For sure. And, um, you know, looking back and, and looking at comparing it, I guess, to some of the other competitions that you've taken part of, what was your favorite thing about this one? Oh, like, honestly, like, probably everything. Like, the whole, just kind of, like, the production of it all. Um, on, but then, like, the people that I was with, not only the chefs that I competed against, um, but, you know, like, the whole crew and everything like that. Like, it's an experience I'll never forget. Um, everyone really, especially, like, all the chefs, like, everyone just becomes a family. Um, and I've never had a more supportive group of people than the chefs that I competed against, so. Well, um, again, we know you can't tell us the outcome, but let's imagine that you did win that $100,000 top prize. How would you spend it? Oh, my, like, I am 21 years old, a line cook, living in this economy. Girl, I'd be paying off my debt. <laughs> <laughs> I got bills to pay, so I'd be taking that, paying those, and putting it into savings. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, you know, looking ahead, where do you, I mean, you're still, still quite young and there's many opportunities for you, but where do you see yourself? Where do you want your career to take you? Um, honestly, I mean, I know it's kind of hard right now, um, especially with COVID, um, but I really just want to be able to travel with it all. Um, I think it's a great trade to, to do that. Um, I received a scholarship back um, a couple years ago to go move to like the Alsace region and make wine and work in Michelin restaurants out there. Um, but uh, alas, COVID has put a halt on all of that. Um, I don't necessarily see Canada as like my kind of like final landing grounds. Um, I just kind of want to travel different countries, experience like authentic cuisine. Everything here is so westernized. Um, I would love to just like go like back to Italy and try somebody's like recipe that's been passed down from like their great Nona or something like that. Um, and just kind of like really experience what each culture has to offer. So, yeah. <laughs> Big plans and yeah, unfortunately the pandemic, you know, has, has halted a lot of that, but glad to see, you know, that you've been able to do things during this time. I want to thank you so much again, Siobhan, and we'll be make sure to root for you when uh, Top Chef airs. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks for having me. So the season of Top Chef Canada debuts April 19th on the Food Network Canada. Be sure to tune in to see how Siobhan fares. Shifting gears a bit, eating is something many of us take for granted, but with food security becoming an ever-growing problem in Northern Canada, many Northern First Nations are exploring different ways to produce food for their communities. As Sarah Connors tells us, a small farm in the Yukon has found a unique way to tackle winter growing while also providing hope and opportunities for the First Nation that owns it. This small working farm in Dawson is doing some big things, like feeding a First Nation in the Yukon. The Trondak Witchin Teaching and Working Farm is a community farm focused on sourcing fresh produce, meat and eggs in a sustainable way. Each year it produces 70 boxes of food for Dawson residents and 75 boxes twice a year free of charge for Trondak Witchin citizens. Farm manager Derek Hastings says he's seen how the farm is contributing to better nutrition firsthand. I find people uh, like that. It's uh, they get this package and they open it up and it's just they they start to make uh, meals based on what they receive fre that's fresh. So that sort of changes people's dietary habits, changes people's shopping habits. Ryan Peterson has been getting food from the farm for three years. With limited access to fresh, affordable food, Peterson says the farm is a sustainable way to feed his family. The kids always enjoy the food. They always have, like, a, I'm a good cook too, so that helps. But it's, it's just really good. It's all natural. Despite its success, Hastings says growing food in Dawson is challenging as the growing season is limited. But by this time next year, all season growing will be possible thanks to an extended season greenhouse. Much like a traditional greenhouse, the new structure will be much bigger and grow year-round while also offering teaching programs. Most of it comes from California or the closest to Alberta, so that'll be unique in that way. And, you know, food security is always an issue up here because we're very reliant on the trucks. 
And there's more to this farm than just food. Trondak Wichin citizens are encouraged to come stay at the farm for free and learn agricultural skills while earning a small income in the process. Hastings says this is especially helpful for those struggling with housing instability and addiction, allowing them to reconnect with tradition, save money, and eventually re enter the workforce. How's it going here? Yeah, pretty good. How are you doing? People staying in their community, being productive, having hope, being a part of a team effort and then having good food, which helps people uh, just be more healthy in their mind and bodies. Eventually, programs will also be in place for Trondak Witch and youth to learn life lessons through farming. I see in the future this really being a way to, for the uh, youth to establish themselves early in life, between 12 and 18, establish important skill sets and understandings of agriculture and understanding of work ethic, and so that'll lend to a preventative measure to a lot of the problems facing the First Nation going forward. So while this might just look like an ordinary farm, for many people it's a place where lessons can be learned well past the growing season. We tend to want, want to engage with all, all types of citizens and give people opportunities and uh, allow them to gather hope from the project, you know, like a, a perspective that sort of lends to like a continuity season to season, year to year. Sarah Connors, APTN National News, Dawson City. We talked to Derek Hastings to find out how the farm is today. He said that they have been busy all winter with animals and getting ready for the new season. In fact, if you are in the Dawson area, you can still sign up for vegetable boxes that will be ready for delivery in July. For more information, you can visit the Trondak Gwich'in Farm page on Facebook. Well, as we heard from Siobhan, she loves fusion food and mixing things up and, well, she's not alone. When we come back after the break, we head to one of Winnipeg's most popular eateries, Feast Bistro, where a Métis Italian dish has been created especially for this show. Stay with us. A few months back, we were welcomed into Feast Cafe and Bistro in Winnipeg by owner Krista Bruno Gunther, who is TV famous herself. You might know her as a judge on Food Network's Wall of Chefs. Two of her cooks at Feast Bistro created recipes just for In Focus. Let's start with Michael Fosnuverbanski, and his dish is a Metis Italian fusion made with bison, but you could use any wild game you've got on hand or beef. Take a look. So, uh, hi there, I'm Michael, um, I'm the catering manager from Feast Cafe and uh, today I'm actually going to show you my recipe, my own personal recipe uh, I thought of. Uh, I'm calling it the, the Little Lost Bison. It's an infusion between our indigenous ingredients and an Italian style dish. So I'll, I'll begin. Um, first of all, we're going to start with our, what should I call it, our marinade. So the marinade I made, it's basically just a combination of oil and olive oil, and a little bit of uh, garlic puree here, a little bit of salt and pepper, and a little bit of sweet grass and chopped up sage, it's already in there. And then uh, you take our nice indigenous style chunks of bison, and you just mix it all up. And you basically let this just sit there for about a day you know, like overnight kind of thing, and you let the flavors just melt in itself, and it'll be perfect. So after that's done, after a day of marinating, you'll end up with this, our marinated bison chunks. So this is like what it looks like when it's been infused with all the flavor of sweetgrass and sage. So once this is all nice and marinated, what we're gonna do is we're gonna make the pasta and while we're making the pasta, we're gonna sear off these bison chunks. Now, I'm a big fan of medium rare steaks, so when you sear it off, I sear it off so that there's still a little bit of blood inside. These are basically like steak chunks, so it's perfectly fine and okay. Before you start cooking anything, you wanna get your water ready. Make, it nice, make sure it's nice and warm, because uh, you wanna start making your pasta in there. 
So you want to get it into a nice rolling boil. A rolling boil means is that when the water starts roiling, uh, boiling, boiling, it'll basically just, you want it at a slow boil. So that way it could just, it won't be overboard, you know? Like when it's too hard of a boil, it'll just keep going really hard. You'll lose most of your water. So you want it to basically be at a nice calm boil, just a nice roll. Anyways, next you wanna, this is gonna be our pan for searing our bison. So you're gonna wanna spray it down with either oil, like spray, oil spray, or just use regular oil. I personally prefer to use oil spray because you won't get as much of a flame coming out from it. If you use oil, use a very small amount, otherwise the oil from your marinade and this will cause it to shoot flames up. So you gotta be careful. So, I'm gonna give it a nice spray. Now this marinade, I forgot to mention, actually has a little bit of lemon juice in it. Nice little lemon. You can use lemon juice like from a bottle, it's fine. You can, it's really cheap and affordable. It's also, you can, it lasts a long time because you can just put it in the freezer. And it basically lasts forever at that point if you don't have access to a fresh lemon. Fresh lemon is a little bit more optimal. You also add a little bit of uh, maple into this, like a shot of maple just to add that little bit of flavor. The maple is to allow the beef to have a little bit extra like sugar to the to the meat itself, while the, while the citrus from the acid of the lemon actually helps break down the meat of the bison so it's nice and tender. Let's start by heating up our pan here. So let's get that guy heated up and while this one's heating up, we're gonna get a little bit of oil in this one, just a shot. It's perfect right there. Don't need much. Let's give it a nice little spread around. Good. Let that heat up. Don't want to get in too hot, otherwise your oil will start to burn. Now you can use, you could use butter. Butter is an okay ingredient for this, but butter, as pure as it is, it'll burn if you're not careful. So I find oil's a little better. Don't use olive oil. That'll for sure burn. It has a, the burn rate on, I mean like the, the the heat level for olive oil to burn is very low, so it won't take much. So just use regular oil like canola or vegetable is fine. So while that pan is heating up for us, this little bit of here, once it's nice and warm, you can tell by putting your hand just a little bit close to it, and you can feel the heat coming from it. This one's already almost there, so let's take a little bit of garlic, little Salt and pepper, just for extra seasoning. And you grab your tongs. You want to break that up. So basically what you want to do is you want to make it so that your garlic puree just gets a nice little golden toastiness. Now you can tell if it's getting too overcooked because it'll start turning brown. If it turns brown, then you've cooked it, overcooked it. So you want to be very careful with that. So I can tell already that I'm starting to do that. So I'm going to turn this down just slightly. Just to make sure I don't overcook it. Now, you will have your garlic puree sticking to the pan. It's not a big deal. Because what we are also going to use is we're going to take this little shot of... of uh, just a tiny little half ounce shot of... Uh, what should I call it? Wine? White wine? And that'll basically give us our deglazing. What white wine does is it deglazes your pan of all the flavors. So stand back. This is going to be a little flamey. As you can tell, all of our flavor came off. Exactly what we want. So now we can add in our milk, our cream. So this is heavy cream. You want to make sure it's heavy cream because it needs to be like whipping cream, it needs to be able to form itself properly inside the pan when it cooks. Milk won't really work that well. So our other pan here is nice and warm, ready to go. Again, be very careful with all this oil. If you're not careful, you will splash yourself and it will hurt. Now you want to grab another tong for this as this will have its own flavors and you want to keep it 
like that. See how it's got that nice little bit of searing on it, nice little bit of brownness? Exactly what you want. That flavor right there. Look at all that flavor. That's about medium rare for me right now, so I don't need that on anymore. That can just sit there now. And let's go back to our pasta sauce. This pasta, while it's boiling like this, you'll get a nice little bubble. Again, you want to make sure it's not too high, because if it gets too high, you will burn the milk. Milk burns at a very easy, it burns very easily, and it will burn on the bottom of this, so you gotta be very careful, especially when you're adding cheese. So, we're gonna add our cheese in now. Add some parm. And this is our gorgonzola. You don't need much. This is very powerful stuff. See enough for flavor, that's it. Boom, done. Next we're gonna mix all this up. And we're gonna let it boil out. As you can see the bubbles boiling there, that means that the liquid is slowly starting to thicken and it's boiling. So you wanna let it do that very slowly, otherwise you'll burn the bottom. While that's happening, we're gonna get our noodles ready inside here. Get them nice and warm. Now I pre-cooked my noodles here. The, I pre-cooked them at a level called El Dante. Basically what that means is that when you cook it, you can look inside the center of it, and inside the center, it'll have the tiniest little white dot in there. That means that the tiniest little amount of it is not fully cooked. So you can just finish cooking it in here like this. Ooh, that's hot. Always make sure you grab some cloth or something to make sure you're handling really hot things like this. Make sure you drain all the excess water. Ooh, ooh. Throw that bad boy in there. And uh, you want to let the noodles cook in with the sauce because the noodles is a starch and it will absorb all the flavor as well with everything else that's going in there. So if you notice it's getting a little too thick, you can add a little bit of cream just to thin it out a little so you have time to cook with it a bit more. But it's always a good idea to test your sauce. You don't need much, you just need a little bit of test. Mm, it's perfect. All right. So next we're gonna plate it. Now when you're plating pasta, you always wanna give it a nice little twirl in this plate, like that, and that way it builds up a nice and high. Get all that nice, beautiful flavor that's left over in there. Like that. So we're gonna take our wonderful looking stick chunk, our nice bison chunks. And then next, we're actually gonna give it a nice little, little garnish of this gorgonzola. Just a little bit, not much. And we'll finish the garnish off a little cedar. Boom. And that is a little lost bison. Super tasty. We'll have that full recipe on our website, aptnnews.ca forward slash in focus forward slash indigenous cuisine. Freezer full of pickerel, sick of having it the same old way? Well, you are in luck. The second dish Feast Bistro Cooks made especially for us is a tribute to missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. Take a look. So hi, my name is Steve. I'm cook here at Feast Cafe Bistro. We're located at the corner of Sherbrooke and Alice, and we're on Treaty 1 territory. So the dish I'm gonna be preparing today, I'm gonna call it Our Sister, and I'm gonna dedicate it to uh, missing and murdered women across our nation. So I'm gonna be working with, with corn. That's one of the three sisters. I'm also gonna be doing pickerel. That's, that's a white fish. It's also good for you. And I'm gonna be doing wild rice. So I'm gonna put it together here. Um, I start with, I do some very light, easy, easy seasonings. 
Just salt and pepper. Fuzz on the ground with the uh, olive oil. Salt and pepper. Drizzle of olive oil across it. Beautiful. We're going to put that in our oven at 350 for 15 minutes. Okay, so what, so what we have here is uh, our cooked fish. Comes out nice and nice and beautiful. All right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna flog the pickerel. So I'm just gonna put it in a bowl, nice like that. Use a fork and just lightly break it up, break it apart. The two forks. So we're not gonna mush it, right? We don't want it to be mushed. We just want it to be nice and fluffy. So whitefish is good food. It's like good all around. You got it. Should eat it once a week. It's good for your brain. It's good for your skin. Also kept our, our people alive for uh, a millennia. Especially here in Manitoba, we have access to pickerel. It's everybody's favorite. Okay, so next we're gonna get the uh, the filling for our fish cake and get that ready to go here. So we're gonna go with uh, the half a tablespoon of dill. Nice big tablespoon of mayo. This is um, garlic puree. If you don't have garlic puree, just use garlic clove. You chop it up, make it nice and small. Throw that in there. Some pepper. Some salt. Your egg. Mix that up. So it's nice. Almost like a pudding texture almost. So it's gonna be nice. Next we're gonna grab lemon. If you don't have lemon, you can use lemon juice. It's fine. Okay. So we're gonna add our fish to our to our filling here. I like to get I like to get my pan nice and hot before I put what I'm working with. I'm using this this margarine, regular margarine. I like to use it because it's pure, it's clean, and it doesn't burn. And everybody has margarine in their house, so. So basically what we're going for is like we're, we're using ingredients that usually, that, that you'd regularly have in your house. The fun part. What that size. A little bone there. Let's roll it around in the breadcrumbs a bit. If it falls apart, it's fine. Let's put some more breadcrumbs. Form it the best you can. When we're cooking the rice, you just put, put a lot of water. 
a little, little, little overcooked, a little dark. But we got to get that cooked right through. Maybe I'll lower the heat a little bit more. So yeah, when I, when I, whenever I smell wild rice, it always reminds me of, uh, reminds me of ceremonies, going to ceremonies when I was a kid. It's like that smell of, of family and people, uh, people are around, like, you know, you're safe and, you know, you're learning, we're learning about a culture, we're learning about our traditional values and stuff, and that, that's what always brings me back to when, uh, when I smell the wild rice. So what I'm doing now is I'm still using margarine. That nice and hot. That should be pretty much okay. So what we're gonna do now is uh, get this nice and hot. I have a half of onion here. It's a half of onion. Nice and diced. Just gonna go ahead and throw it on. What we're gonna do is get that nice and caramelized. A little bit more garlic puree, just to. It's gonna be a. If you don't have, if you don't have the garlic puree, you can go ahead and use like a, a whole garlic, mince it up, get it nice and chopped up, nice and mincy. It's a little bit much. I'm gonna put my corn. This is gonna be the fun part. So we're really gonna be cooking. So it's gonna start popping. As soon as it gets, as soon as it gets to the right temperature, it's gonna pop a bit. So I guess. A long time ago, when I used to do the harvest around this, this time of year, I could just picture this too, like, I guess they would take the, uh, the corn kernels and put them on the rocks beside the fire, and then the, uh, it'll pop, right? It'll pop like popcorn, and then they would be gathered out of the fire and I guess be catching, catching the popcorn in their mouth. I always picture that, I always imagine, especially when I'm working with corn. So again, this dish is called Our Sister. We're using the corn, pickerel. All the stuff from the land. So we're gonna go ahead and let that cook. I'm gonna spray some water just to help the process with the cooking a little bit. Go ahead and cover it. Just drop some of that air in there. Mm. That's good. And it's okay right there. Okay, so I'm just gonna go ahead and throw the uh, uh, wild rice in there. My well. That's the beautiful thing about wild rice. Mm -mm -mm. So now to plate it. Oops. And then garnish it. Oh, you can make tartar sauce, equal parts mayo, equal parts relish, and a pinch of dill. This goes just beautiful. And then we're gonna garnish it with some.
another super delicious meal. Thanks again to the feast chefs for cooking that up for us. That's all the time we have for this food edition of In Focus. I'm Brittany Hobson filling in for Melissa Ridgen, and it's safe to say I'm walking away from the show very hungry. I want to thank you all for tuning in today. Next week, I'll be back again. Join me as we talk business and hear the startup stories of some amazing entrepreneurs and find out how what business looks like in a post-COVID world. This week's episode is available as a podcast, as are all In Focus shows. Check them out at eptnnews.ca slash podcast. Have a great afternoon.